How's it going, everyone? Welcome to the landscape here at Strawberry Bank Museum. I'm Eric Wilholtz, Curator of Historic Landscapes, and today I want to introduce you to a few of our gardens, walking through and focusing on seed. Now, seed collection sustains our gardens here and certainly teaches the community how to sustain their gardens at home. Seed collection is one of the easiest methodologies to sustain resources within your local landscape, all sorts of heritage heirloom breeds coming out of cultivation. Now, let's get into a few varieties and we'll get into those specific methodologies that we'll use here at Strawberry Bank and certainly methodologies you can practice at home. Let's get into it. Now, we grow several types of cucurbits here at Strawberry Bank. Now be aware cucurbits are one of those families that cross very easily. Crossing creates hybrids. This is patty pan squash. Now patty pan goes all the way back to Native American history. Now you can see a few pollinators here, which certainly benefits seed collection in those long-term efforts for season. And that's why we actually grow quite a lot of flowers ornamental flowers around our foodways crops to bring in these pollinators. I've got a few samples here. Now, patty pan is quite a unique variety. On the right here, this is more of the eating size. Now, when you are selecting your fruit throughout your landscapes, throughout your gardens, be aware of the size and maturation rate of your crops. Now, collecting something for food might not yield viable seed. In fact, likely not. At a certain stage, the seed will certainly be set inside, but it won't be viable for germination. You want to age your crops to a certain extent, allowing that seed to mature to that point where you get a lot of viability. So again, size is really effective at producing viable seed. So at those early stages, a lot of those times you're eating those crops and later stages, those are the types of crops that you're seed collecting and often eating as well. Small crops are often filled with a lot more sugars because those sugars will eventually transfer their energies to seed production within the fruit. Now carrots are what we call a biennial. Now biennials, when we're growing those, we have to determine you know, that second year production of seed. Now there are a few ways to grow biennials for seed production. Now for carrots, for instance, you can actually see some roots. The majority of carrots can be eaten during one season, but if you leave, let's say 5% within the ground, next year, hopefully, they'll come back and produce those beautiful flowers, those humble flowers and seed set. Now in one carrot, you can produce hundreds of seeds with a lot of these open pollinated varieties. Now open pollination simply means they're open to the elements the diverse amount of genetics in the open environment as opposed to a closed system. Now closed systems will control phenotypes and genotypes. They're systems that are controlled more and more to control the variables of what you're cultivating, what you're producing, and certainly the variables of the genetics. So open pollinated varieties like these heirlooms throughout our landscape are exposed to a lot more genetic diversity. Now a lot of people are a little nervous allowing these things to go through win winter and really relying on that survival for next spring. Now, a few things can happen with our root crops throughout our winter if we're waiting and sitting on them for that seed production the second year. Now, animals can get at them, the weather can get at them, all sorts of stress during the winter, next spring for your root crops for these biennials. A lot of traditional farmers and gardeners will harvest all of them, eat most of them, but store your roots that you want to actually plant next season in sand in like a root cellar or cool basement. This allows you to plant these roots with that cold treatment after the winter next spring. Now the cold treatment is what really vernalizes or really engages those signals within the plant to produce flowers, to produce seed. Now cold treatments or vernalization will signal roots like this to produce certain things the second year. 
Okay, that's really specific to a lot of biennials and certainly perennials when it comes to flowering and producing seed. Here we have tomato. This is Pomodoro tomato, actually. Now remember that seasonality of certain crops, we will find different signals throughout our seasonality that will tell us when seed collection should occur. Now ripeness of tomatoes is really easy to determine based on the color. Now getting familiar with certain varieties is especially important because some varieties will really, really darken up with color. That's the stage of seed collection. Others will be a little bit lighter in color. We certainly rotate varieties throughout our landscape annually, so we don't actually cross, okay? Now tomatoes compared to cucurbits do not cross as easily as that family. Tomatoes are a great source of seed production. Annually, we get seed. Annually, we get food. So as opposed to biennials, tomatoes are annuals in this region at least. Let's go take a look at the lettuce. Down the pathway we go. You can still hear those chickens. They're very verbal. That morning chorus, as we call it. Here is lettuce. So at this stage, it really doesn't even look like lettuce, does it? Unless you're familiar with seed production. Lettuce will bolt or elongate past that vegetative stage pretty quickly. And that's why we often utilize succession planting with lettuce. Succession planting is simply planting the same species over and over again within the same seed system, the same seasonality, the same year. Now these fuzzy parts, there we go. Now you can see this stage of seed production. Okay, you can actually see slightly that seed beneath these fuzzy parts. You can notice, as we get a little bit closer, the seed just below. With a bit of investigation, you'll get more and more familiar at the signals plants will give you, signaling when that seed is ready, okay? It's pretty obvious that at the stage where the plant wants to release seed into the wind or drop it down, you'll often sometimes actually see seed that's already dropping on the floor. This is the signal that it's time to seed collect because obviously that's the natural mechanism, that stage in which the seed drops or disperses seed. Uh, this is for relange loose lettuce. Um, it's a really nice bib lettuce, um, very similar to a butter lettuce, um, that common kind of general term for lots of sweet lettuces. Uh, give it a try if you ever get a chance. We grow this quite often. Um, that's loosely translated for relish loose to painted trout or speckled trout lettuce. Really, really nice. So give that a try. Okay. How's it going, everyone? Welcome to the Sherburn Garden. This is our oldest installation of a kitchen garden here at Strawberry Bank, where we collect quite a few seeds throughout the season, including our lettuce here. This is tennis ball lettuce. We've got calendula over here in full bloom and setting seed. We've got some carrots, fruiting, flowering, going to seed. That is second year production. Again, those carrots are what we call biennials. And then behind me, we've got some leeks in fruit producing seed. Onions are another one of our biennials. Last but not least, we have some elecampane in the sunflower family up against the fence. Now let's take a closer look at what seed is available this time of year, step by step throughout the Sherburn garden. Let's take a closer look. Okay, here we have calendula. Now calendula in the aster family is very easy to grow annually. You'll see some really nice flowers, either this light yellow or dark orange. You'll certainly get different physical characteristics or phenotypes through these open pollinated varieties. So you will get a few variations of flower color. Seed will emerge like this, but notice how green this still is. Believe it or not, this is seed inside, kind of wrapping itself together like that. But you are often looking for, again, that color 
Let's grind some up actually. And here's the seed. Now, believe it or not, that curvature, that itself is the seed, that curved seed. Now, being brown, this is nice and dry. So you will often be able to just dry this on paper or just some type of cloth, but it does not have a lot of water content to it. Be aware that when you're storing seed, the one variable that you want to manipulate and control, manage, is water content. So drier herbs, drier veggies, drier perennial seeds will certainly be more successful without a few different methods. For instance, for the tomatoes, for the cucumbers, for again, those fruiting bodies, you will often need fermentation or a long process of drying in order to store things well, uh, get germination rates, and certainly avoid a lot of the disease or molds that occur in storage with too much water content, okay? So a lot of these dry seeds are a little bit easier compared to other seeds that we produce here at Strawberry Bank. Calendula is great. Um, uh, really, really nice self-sowing annual in this area. Again, these types of plants will often drop quite a lot of seed coming back naturally, but you can collect them as well if you want to spread them out. But do not be surprised. If you cultivate these types of self-sowing annuals, they will most likely come up on their own next season. Not only in the location that you've grown, but certainly spread out and certainly into pathways. So leeks in the onion family are one of my favorite things to grow, especially for that sustainable seed system. So this is the seed head. Oh, just so beautiful, all right? This is the seed head that emerges from leek um, every second year. Um, biennials will often perish. They will often die after that second year, okay? What we eat is certainly the stalk, okay? Uh, the root system, part of the crown, um, at this stage, most of the sugars are already in the seed. So those biennials, you don't want often to eat that second year. Carrots, for instance, everything we buy in the stores, the markets, farmer's markets, that's first year carrot. Similar to leeks, what we often eat is first year and its second year production is all about seed. Now pollinators love this one as well, bringing quite a lot of pollinators in. Uh, wasps and other things, not your typical honeybees or really typical pollinators. Many different pollinators will set the seed of leek. Now, believe it or not, this is again that exponential seed production. Believe it or not, in each of these little flowers is about two to three seeds. Um, so let me see if I can get a few of those out. There's the seed right there. Okay. So, but you can see there's actually a couple in here. So just imagine how many seeds are in that entire seed head. Absolutely enormous amount of seed based on one seed germinating, cultivating it all the way to the second year seed production. So hundreds and hundreds of seeds. Next, we're gonna go over and check out Ella Campaign. Again, this is in the sunflower family. And this was traditionally used as a digestive tonic amongst other um, types of treatments. Very similar to how we make dandelion uh, tonics or dandelion wines, if you want to get to that fermentation process. So the seed head, and very similar um, to all asters, uh, large seed heads, small seed heads. But at this stage, it almost looks like a little tiny sunflower with all sorts of different seeds quite a lot of chaff in here. So again, these varieties can be utilized through a winnowing system. You can actually see the wind doing it itself. So a little blow on my hand and a lot of that chaff disappears and you can see the seed on the palm of my hand. And what do we have here? Can anyone guess what this one is? It is not fennel, but what's more important in the colonial period when it comes to food preservation. This is dill. Now dill often offers a lot of flavor to pickling and preservation, but the seed itself, if not the foliage as well, is a preservative. 
still is a vegetative annual going to seed very quickly. So really wild, these tend to cultivate on their own and just kind of miraculously volunteer throughout the landscape. Give this one a try, one of the easiest ways to produce dill seed. Uh, again, this is like the annual lettuces, you know, producing vegetation and seed almost immediately uh, throughout the season. Uh, dill is one of the varieties that you really don't have to worry about water content. Um, you can see how dry it is already just straight off the plant. Uh, but always keep in mind when you're collecting in mason jars, don't put the lid on immediately. You know, even when we think that there's little water content in this type of seed, you know, there's always minute amounts of it. Um, and it's quite the learning process, just, you know, kind of killing one jar of seed by sealing it too early and finding some mold issues within the jar. That almost immediately deteriorates the quality of your seed. My suggestion is simply to harvest and put them into containers, but to be a little patient on sealing those containers if you're sitting on seed for long periods of time, okay? Hello everyone, welcome to the Goodwin Garden. Now the Goodwin Garden here at Strawberry Bank interprets the original 1870 design that existed on the other side of town. So this reproduction rotating different exotic species that were arriving from let's say Mexico and South America and Africa and different parts of the world during the 19th century. So this garden is certainly more to do with very unique heirloom flowers as opposed to food crops. Now getting into the flowers, behind me is one of our favorite species, Celosia. Now this variety, often commonly called coxcomb celosia, will yield quite a bit of seed. Now there are two categories when it comes to ornamental seed production. Often just that wild aspect of outgrowths, lots of seed dropping for instance, like our California poppy and a few other varieties. Sometimes this as well will certainly naturally drop and then come back on its own. We call these self-sowing annuals. Now you can collect them as well manually by hand and this one yields quite a bit of seed. Now some varieties of flowers have very small seeds, some varieties of flowers have large seeds. Small seeds are a little tricky to collect because they are so minute. This one looks like little tiny black seeds. Very, very small, probably not as small as let's say poppy. We do grow poppies here and collect that as well, but very, very small little black seeds. Now food waste crops along with flower crops can use a certain methodology of basically using paper bags when things are dry to bring plants upside down, shake a little bit in that paper bag and releasing some of that seed. Most of it will come out, but sometimes you'll have to break up that chaff a little bit so you release more and more seed. At the stage where plants will naturally expand and naturally drop seed, that's often the same time you wanna collect manually, okay? From Celosia to a few other varieties, we do collect here in Goodwin Garden, sustaining our ornamental species in parallel to a lot of food crops that we grow in other locations throughout the landscape. Many perennials here in Goodwin Garden that really don't rely on seed production, they emerge more from that crown. So consider perennial cultivation in parallel to a lot of those seed producing annuals, biennials, and other species of plants. Let's get into a few more varieties here in Goodwin and we'll see what seed is being set and explain a few different methods and how we collect these ornamental species when it comes to seed. Let's get into a few examples. Now we grow quite a little bit of heirloom annuals, rotating them almost yearly. This is California poppy at the base. Great border plant. This is our native poppy named after California because it grows wild throughout that region of the country. Now it does come back based on its seed production but this time of year, you can find seed pods to collect. And let's take a closer look to see if we can find those. 
Now here is the seed pod, okay? Now this one, for instance, let's just use this as a sample, is green. Now again, those signals for color will teach you the stages at which you wanna collect the seed. Green is often a reflection of immaturity with fruits, okay? From seed pods all the way up to cucurbits and other fruits that are much larger. It's not the green ones you wanna collect, but the brown ones, okay? And I actually see a perfect one. Here we go. We can see that now. So you can see that color, okay? Um, uh, certainly when it's dry, it will start splitting on its own, and that's why we see California poppy coming back almost every year. All right, one of my favorite varieties this year is Datura, or Moonflower. Now this is an amazing plant. Let's get a little shot of this amazing flower. This is often called Moonflower because it does bloom at night or in cool temperatures, and that's why you see it actually still open here this morning. Now, Datura is really easy to spot when it comes to seed production. These very spiky fruits are very prickly, and then they start turning brown and they split open. Now, this is mostly an ornamental variety that a lot of people will grow in their Victorian designs, if not simple perennial borders. You know, around houses, it's certainly beautiful along driveways and pathways. Um, very, very cool species and very drought tolerant as well. Now, once those seed pods actually turn brown and split, you'll often find seed on the ground, okay? And you can actually see some piles from the remnants of those split pods, okay? So sometimes you can actually find seeds on the ground just below these types of annuals. Again, when plants will naturally split and start releasing seed, that's often the same time you want to actually collect the seed. Really, really cool. Again, this is Datura or Moonflower. Awesome, awesome flower. Well, I hope everyone enjoyed that short garden tour, seed coming out, beautiful flowers, beautiful foliage, all sorts of things happening here magically throughout the landscape. This is Strawberry Bank.